this podcast is brought to you by Midwinter. These guys were a startup, an entrepreneurial startup some 10 years ago, way before it was even cool to be a tech startup, and have since then gone on to win every single award year after year after year when it comes to financial advice software. I use them, um, I know a lot of people that have, and if you haven't already jumped onto the new way of doing business, which is all cloud-based and API, so it all talks to each other, then go look at yourself in the mirror and sort yourself out and go get Midwinter. Cool, so we might kick things off. Um, thanks guys for, for jumping on. Really excited to bring you uh, the West up and coming superstar financial planner, Kat Cairns this morning. Um, Kat's going to talk a bit, a bit more about her background, so I won't go into it in too much detail, but um, she's doing some really cool stuff in her business, relatively new-ish to the advice uh, game. She was a rising star um, finalist for last year, and um, yeah, looking, looking forward to, to getting some of her wisdom. Um, just before we get into the session, though, guys, um, just wanted to let you know we've got some some really good sessions coming up the next few weeks. We've got Brett Evans coming up next week to talk about uh, expat advice, and um, then we've got uh, Kate Holmes from the US. So she runs a fee-only financial planning business. Um, I've known Kate for a, a little while, and she's doing some really cool stuff. So that'll be a great session. And then we're going to dive deep into a bit of client messaging, and we've got a couple of cool sessions planned around that as well. Um, so also, um, if for anyone Sydney-based, we've got uh, the next XY Social event is coming up this Thursday. I think there's like five tickets left. Uh, if anyone's not already coming um, or has, has connections that are coming as well. So looking forward to that. We've got the guys from Acorns and also Key Person of Influence. It's set to be an awesome session and we're looking forward to, uh, to catching up with everyone. So cool. So Kath. Um, thanks for thanks for jumping on the line. It's awesome to have you here. Um, just as a bit of an intro, can you just give us a bit of your background as to how you got into advice and what your business looks like, how long you've been going for, and those sorts of things? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so uh, I predominantly worked in, from the age of 18, I worked in a broking firms here in Perth. And um, when I started my family, um, I wanted to work closer to home. So I, my, our office is in Rockingham, which is about 40 minutes from the Perth CBD, and that's where I live. Um, and I knew I had all this you know, knowledge about financial services industry, about broking, and I you know, knocked on Hillwell's door and said, you know, can I work part-time? And in the first, in, I started at Pillwell's at 2009 in um, an administration role, and the first year that I started at Pillwell's, uh, the principal and owner, Rick, he um, had, you know, something like three uh, personal protection claims and one was quite significant, which really resonated with me about the importance of, gosh, you have your investments and you're creating wealth, um, uh, you know, with, with broking, I never really looked at the bigger picture, so in relation to wealth protection and, you know, it was a... a a lady who was a little bit older than me, she had young kids, they had a family business and she was diagnosed with breast cancer and she received a trauma benefit. So I think in that particular year, I was like, wow, I really love this industry. There's so much more to, you know, what we can do uh, in relation to, you know, wealth creation and wealth protection. And, you know, had another baby along the way and, you know, Rick encouraged me to study and, um, you know, the first of November, uh, sorry, the first of July, two thousand and fourteen. I was appointed an authorised subauthorised rep of Pure Wealth, and yeah, that, that's essentially how I I got into the industry. Um, and you know, I've been sitting face to face with clients just over two years now. So yeah, does that help? Cool. <laughs> yeah, it's good. You, you made the right decision. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I'm really really passionate about. Um, you know, wealth protection and personal protection for, for you know, Australians. And I, I um, have seen the benefits and ultimately that's what made, my, made me go into, you know, financial planning um, was there's a whole lot to wealth creation and not you should be looking at the bigger picture. And I think what financial advisors do in Australia for people is really important and significant 
and sometimes that wealth protection section gets overlooked and that's what we do yep so. yeah okay cool so i suppose you already answered a little bit but can you tell us who you work with and what sort of work you do primarily with those people Okay, so when I started, actually before I was um, authorised, I knew that there was a community within um, where I live, here in, in Rockingham and in Perth, that were, you know, screaming out for a bit of attention and um, that's, and a lot of people might know this or they might not, but um, that was the Kiwi community and New Zealanders living here in Perth and, um, yeah, so I specifically targeted that niche i guess you could say and and um teamed up with some uh, non-profit organizations and you know went out there and spoke to them about why it's important that they should have personal protection here in australia and also talk to them about what superannuation is because it's different to you know what they have over in new zealand in relation to kiwi saver which is relatively new they could see that the money was being taken out of their, their pay but they really didn't understand it. So going out there and talking to that particular community and raising awareness and telling them, look, you know, I understand your needs. You know, come and have a chat and see if we can help you. So okay. The sort of and why, and sorry, go on. You go. No, you go. I was just going to say why Kiwis. Well, Apart from the um, fact that they're really friendly. Yeah, they are. Um, I'm actually married to a. I'm actually married to one, so I'm a lucky girl. And um, you guys didn't watch your rugby together, I'm guessing. We yeah, we do, but I definitely do not go for the All Blacks. Sorry if there's any Kiwis watching. I am true, well and truly um, Australian supporter. So let's hope we can um, uh, win the Bledisloe coming up in the next few weeks because um, yeah, it's been a long time. We've been down and out for a while as well. <laughs> So I want to be able to give it back a bit. Well, we did. We, did, we won the gold medal in the Olympics against the Kiwis. I know. The female oh, yeah. Rugby. That was that last night. Uh, I think, yeah, yeah. The night yeah, before, yeah, I think, yeah. Yeah, because my anyway, husband was He was not very happy about that, let me tell you. Because <laughs> <laughs> I think they lost to Japan. Sorry if anyone's watched it anyway. So, yeah. Okay, what were we talking about? <laughs> So, so why? So, yeah, why? Apart from the fact that your your husband's Kiwis, is there was there you know things that drew you to that demographic? Yeah, there was. Um, you know, they particularly when they when New Zealanders come to Australia, there's no safety net for them. You know, in terms of you know if they get sick or injured, they you know they 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 haven't got. Centrelink or, or the government to rely on. So it's really important that like the message is, is that they should come over here and they should have plans in place. And especially like, you know, we, and at Peel Wealth, we deal with a lot of Kiwis that unfortunately do pass away. And, you know, they come to us for help with, um, you know, uh, claiming it, you know, any of their death benefits that they may have, but the cost associated with repatriation, there's really unique issues that they face. So personal protection is really important and making sure that they're getting the right personal protection and the right policies that cover them um, and, you know, explaining to them how it works. It's a little bit, maybe it's a little bit different to what they've experienced in New Zealand, but yeah, just talking to them essentially about, you know, making sure they're covered what they what they need what we do but it's more specific for them more unique unique things that they need to plan for than say a an Australian for instance who yeah. they might go, and we all know a lot of Australians go oh, the government will bail me out but you know um, when it comes to talking about not all of them but you know when it comes to talking about personal protection planning New Zealanders just don't have that safety net here so and they come to, to Perth and they come to Australia and they they buy houses they've got they've got the same things and aspirations that we have but they just don't have any sort of you know safety net here so it's really important to have that conversation with them and they want to know about it okay yeah. yeah yeah okay cool and um, just in that market, yeah, I suppose you just touched on it, but it, you, do you find that they're receptive to doing this sort of financial planning or is there any issues with the fact that they are from overseas and might move back there and does that sort of complicate things at all? Um, 
Not particularly, no. Um, a lot of them do come over here and they do plan to stay indefinitely. Um, um, you know, they... No, I don't seem to have any... Actually, what I get from a lot of the people when I sit down with them and I explain to them how superannuation works, you know, it should be working for you, it's your money, you should be looking after it, you can actually take this back to you when you go back to New Zealand. Now, they thank me and they go, oh, you know, I didn't really know, you know, thanks very much and you know, knowledge is power, I guess, and they really, they seem really appreciative, you know, and, you know, talking to them about, um, you know, situations and scenarios that, you know, potentially could happen they're like well I didn't that never crossed my mind I never thought about that so yeah and then because I've teamed up when I do my seminars I've teamed up with a non-profit organization called Oz Kiwi and you know yeah we talk about estate planning issues we talk about superannuation and we talk about personal protection and then we get Oz Kiwi to come along and do a chat about our pathways to citizenship because it's not easy for New Zealanders to have a direct pathway to citizenship. So they come in and talk to them about their options and what's happening and those changes and it all kind of intertwines together and they walk away with, yep. you know, a, I think I'm going to go and have a, a, a chat to Kath and then I'm going to, you know, talk to Kiwi about what my options are because they seem to know what's going on. So, yeah. Yeah, cool. Okay, and how do you how do you find your clients? Because I know you're doing some interesting things in that space. Um, how do I find my clients? Well, I I do a lot of um, well, in my second year, um, I have a lot of my clients now seem to be referring, so I'm getting a lot of referrals. But I, I put myself out there, I guess. I, you know, I go out to. I'm heavily involved in local networking groups here in Perth. Um, you know, we have community multicultural events and we, you know, have a little stall down down at those particular things. Just, I don't know, having a presence. Um, and I tend to, to look for parts of the community that have a need. And we've discussed this previously, but recently you know, where Rockingham is, we have um, Alcoa and they've, uh, recently had some changes. They're no longer self-insured. They're now um, insured by an external provider. Um, and there's there quite some, some significant changes which I had been watching along the way. So you know, we went out to the, the community and said, look, we understand the changes that are happening within in relation to your super and your insurances. Do you understand them? Do you have any questions? And, you know, um, go out there and talk to that particular community. So I guess it's have finding a need that people have and being able to go out yep. there and show them that, you know, you can help them and, and just getting out there in front of people, you know, all the time, doing stuff um, within the community, really. Yeah. Yeah, okay. And I understand you do, you do a fair few sort of seminars and live workshops. And is it true, as a follow-up question, is it true that you had a butcher at one of your workshops that you run? Yes, I did. Um, one of the very, very first ones I did when I started was um, Why Women Rock and it was focused um, to you know, my female audience and I thought to myself, I, I try to think about what I would like and um, let's, well, I hope I don't offend anybody, but financial planning can be boring. So if you're going to do a seminar on no. financial planning, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> if you're going to do a seminar on financial planning, you've got to make it interesting. You want people to you know, come along and hear about it. You don't want to just talk about superannuation because they'll probably all fall asleep. Um, so what I did was um, I got one of our um, I got one of our um, local female. She's actually the first female butcher in Australia. Her name's Grace Maiolo. She has she's called the Butcher Who Bakes. She has a radio program here in Perth on um, Radio Six PR, and she does uh, Cooking with Grace segment. And she also um, does that with Bob Mormal, who's who's probably um, what we call like a, a shock jock in in radio um, over here in yep. WA. And so mm -hmm. I asked them if they would come along and we talked about, uh, you know, the needs of women in financial planning and, you know, 
try to raise some awareness there with our audience. And then Grace got up and did a talk about her journey from, you know, working in a male dominated industry and, you know, where she is today, how she's, you know, she's got her own cookbook. She's very well established businesswoman, And then they did a cook off and everyone got a free cookbook and yeah, it was great. It was really awesome. I enjoyed it. And a lot of um, the people that attended, a lot of my um, attendees, and ended up being clients. So, yeah, it's great. So I do things differently, I guess. Yeah. I just go up. Yeah, like to do things a little bit different. Okay. And what? so what advice, because I know that, you know, you hear people doing workshops and um, engaging with clients sort of within the one-to-many level, but what, what advice would you give to someone that's uh, thinking about going down that path or wanting to engage with people in that, that way? Um. Well, first, first of all, be yourself. But go, if you're going to go and talk about, you know, financial planning and, and specifically, or maybe um, personal protection, or you, you need to make it interesting to get people to come along to the to the seminars. So um, mm-hmm. I guess where 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 it's worked for me is with New Zealanders. I've teamed up with Oz Kiwi, which is you know in relation to the Pathways to Citizenship, which is a, a thing that people are interested in. And then they also are interested in super and, and personal protection. And then, again, I guess with the you know, female-focused financial planning, teaming up with a, a woman who can empower other women and show other women that they're doing things. Um, yeah, and, and, and I guess that's essentially how, you know, I've, I've I guess you should, you know, be a little bit different. Be unique. Mm, yeah. In, yeah, that's good advice. I hope I'm answering your questions all right. <laughs> you do? Yeah, yeah. No, I think, I think, that's, I think that's, that's great advice. Uh, okay, so two years in, uh, what is your, or just over two years in, what has been your biggest challenge and the most important thing that you've learned? My biggest challenge? Okay, the, the biggest thing that I have learned so here at Pure Wealth, um, the principal and owner's been in business since 1978, a long time. So he has formed good uh, relationships with centres of influence in his business. And when I came along, um, he, you know, said there's younger people within those, those alliances that, you know, you should team up with. And I thought, okay, no problems, I'll do that. And one of the things that I found earlier on is, it's really important to know who you're referring your clients to. So because one alliance with the principal might, you know, be a long-standing relationship doesn't necessarily mean people within that business will be, you know, the right fit for my business because essentially Rick and I have two, two businesses, right? So alert that quick and, you know, making sure you know who you're referring your clients to um, and, yeah, because... When I initially started doing that, I started getting some, you know, bad feedback from, you know, my clients and, you know, that particular person wasn't very helpful. And that's, that, that is a bad reflection on myself. So I quickly um, yeah. got on to And, yeah, my own personal mortgage broker is now uh, my, one of my major um, centres of influence. And he understands me. I understand him. We both have the same values. And... You know, we work well together. So if that was one thing I could say to somebody starting out is really know who you're referring your clients to because people rely on us to, to refer them to, you know, um, people who are going to look after them. Yeah, okay. And I think, you know, centres of influence and referral partners is, uh, is something that, you know, everyone's sort of interested in. Do you have any tips for people that would that are looking to to find good people apart from, you know, making sure that they're alignment, but in terms of how, you know, you go about sort of finding these people or then how how you go about sort of fostering that relationship with them? Um, um, well, essentially, when it, when it comes to my centres of influence, so my the mortgage broker that I use was my own personal. I, I, I actually thought, oh, I've, you know, I, I better not 
contact my, you know, I, I, I don't know. I was probably a little bit shy when I started out. And, uh, you know, if you don't ask, you don't get. That's what I learned quickly. And yep. when I explained to him about, you know, he actually rang me for a coffee to catch up and I told him what I was doing. He knew I was going down that path. And from the outset, I told him, you know, this particular, these experiences I was having. And from there, um, you know, it went, it went well, he's, he's very much a big part of my success in my business, to be honest. Uh, he's put a lot of trust in me mm-hmm. and you know, vice versa, it goes back. But more so, he's put a lot of trust in me being a new advisor starting out, growing my, my business organically. I didn't have that client base where I could just refer back to him. So he's, he's, he's essentially put a lot of trust in me, I'd imagine. Well, that's how I feel. Mm-hmm. Um, and then networking. So I have a, a great general insurance broker that um, I met through a local networking group and I guess getting to know them on a bit more of a personal level as well because, I don't, you know, that's just who I am. I, I, I'd like to know a little bit more about people that I'm referring my clients to. So, you know, catching up socially and um, yeah, getting them to do some work personally for me has been good. Um, I also have a really good referral alliance with the state planning solicitor here in, just down the road from the office and um, she yep. allows... She allows me to sit on sit in on her estate planning appointments, so I'm learning from her. But she's also I'm referring my clients to because I, I, I physically see what she does. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm also building yes. up knowledge, um, you know, that I can take back to my clients by her allowing me to to sit in on those estate planning appointments. So, um, and I met both of yep. those, the full insurance and the estate planning solicitor, a local business networking group. So one thing I would say is to get out there and get networking in your local community. Yeah, okay. Good advice. Okay, and so uh, what have you got coming up? What's on the cards the next 12 months? What's your what's your plans for world domination? Um, I'm just con- going to continue on doing what I'm doing. Um, I've just about finished my advanced diploma. I've got one more unit of that. So obviously furthering my education is definitely on my... Um, you know, priority list. Um, yeah, so um, I can see people asking messages down the bottom. Am I meant to answer those no, right no, now? No. I'll get to them. Uh, okay. we'll come oh, to them sorry. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I feel rude. I feel rude not answering them. Hi, everybody. Uh, I can see them. <laughs> Hopefully I'll be able to answer them in a minute. Um, but, yeah, just continuing on, furthering my education. You know, I don't particularly... You know, I don't know everything. And one of the things that I would say to people who are starting out and they're growing their business business organically is to, um, you know, connect with other advisors in your area and talk to them. What I found over here in Perth is that a lot of the advisors are really willing to share their information with you. Um, and don't discount the old older advisors. I think we have a an opportunity we can both learn from each other. I know um, the principal and owner here at Pure Wealth, um, he teaches me a lot, but at the same time, he's learning a lot from me, taking his business into the digital age and, and, you know, um, showing him ways that we can do things better. Not, not always, but then he can also show me and mentor me in ways that, that I'm giving my advice, which, you know, scenarios that he's obviously come up against in the last 30 years and how to deal with them. So, yeah, I would, I would say one of the biggest things that I did when I started was the AFA's mentoring program and I was able to connect with some really awesome advisors. My, one of my um, main mentors was Mark Rando at Rando & Associates. He's got an amazing business um, and, yeah, to, so, yeah, get on board and get out there and, and connect and, and talk to people and that's essentially what I do and, and, and one of the things... I've always had in my life is if you don't ask, you don't get. So I ask if they say no, if they say yes, great. So yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. Well, I, I think that's it for my for the main questions I wanted to ask. But I know that Phil's got some for you as well, so I'll turn it over to Phil. Yeah, I got I got plenty of questions, Kath. So I'm going to ask some questions that I've thought of, and then I'm going to throw over to questions that um that people have been asking, uh, and we've got heaps of them. Um, so first one, just want to get a clearer idea of your business. Are you mainly risk only, or risk and a little bit of super, or holistic advice? Um, risk, super, and investment. So, um, but 
I am really passionate about personal protection. That's probably, um, you know, an area where I've had a, you know, a really personal experience with personal protection in my own family. So, um, you know, when I see people and, uh, you know, one of the areas in our business is that at Peel Wealth we've become known as, um, you know, the place to go if you've got a claim. So a lot of people who are now clients are coming to us to assist for help in assisting them with, with claims processes. Um, and, you know, I guess, you know, uh, it's something that I, I think a lot of Australians need and, um, you know, it's been... Yeah, that I don't just do risk. I do everything yeah. essentially, but I think that I'm really passionate about and um, yeah, what I what I enjoy doing. Yeah, yeah I yeah. really do enjoy, I enjoy it. Yeah, no, that's good. Uh, and and it's pure wealth. Peel, as in oh, orange peel. peel. Ah, right. I wrote down Puma. Sorry. I wasn't I wasn't sure what was going. Yeah, no, peel. Yeah, in the Peel region here. In, if anyone doesn't realise, it's ah. the Peel region. Yeah. Got it. Got it. All right. So we've got heaps of questions. I got emailed some questions in the last few days, uh, and heaps of questions have been flooding in. So we'll, we'll try and get through as many as we can. Um, so uh, Justin emailed me, Justin Highland, uh, and he said, um, "All right, he, uh, I'd love some insights on how you implemented best practices uh, for engaging and your advice and implementing." the advice and the ongoing services. So how, how did you kind of learn and gather uh, what you think is best practices in all these areas? Come on. Um, so... Uh, um, Was it more, did you come into the business and, and things were all set or did you kind of... Uh, reinvent the wheel and, 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 you know, learn about what you thought was a better way of doing things and, and did you have the freedom to be able to do that? Well, because I've, I've come into a business that's already been established, I'm limited to what I can change within that business, which cool. is something, you know, um, I, I does frustrate me at times. Um, but the, the, when it comes to the best interest and, and best practice and talking about the ongoing service offering with my clients, um, when, when I discuss that with them and I explain to them, you know, about um, having an advisor there to, you know, walk you through these, you know, some particular stages within their life, um, you know, they, they all seem really happy. And what, so I'm a little bit lost with the question. So what specifically... Um, so it's more, I guess, because you you started um, when you, when you started. How did you get a good sense of best practices? Was it mainly you just started um, copying what Peel Wealth was doing? No. Well, I guess yeah, I, I had to because uh, you know I, I was under, I, I still am with my my practice principle. But that's there are things that you know I've yeah, we. For him, it was harder for him to say, you know, with um, the ongoing service offering and you have to show value for the advice. If you're charging an ongoing service fee, you need to be able to articulate that value. So things that we've implemented in our business since, so it was a little bit more difficult for him to, to um, and I'm sure he won't mind me saying this, mm -hmm. to, you know, um, to, to do things because he wasn't doing things like the seminars. He wasn't, we actually have, um, uh, you know, market updates for our clients and we do like a Christmas function. Well, it's not really a Christmas function, but it's more a social networking function for our clients, which our clients love. And he, we weren't doing that prior. And I said, we, I, as an advisor, need to be able to show value in for my clients, you know, to, to, for them to still want to, you know, engage in my services. And we have our financial wisdom also do a client dinner once a year as well, which we invite our clients to. So, yes, I am limited to what I can do because I, I'm working with a, a practice principal here. But at the same time, this is what I was trying to say before, he, it has been difficult to get him to do those things at times. And, you know, he's, he's like, oh, I'm spending money and rah, rah, rah. <laughs> But I said, we ha this is the way the industry is going and we have to now start showing people um, the, the value in having an advisor and they're the ways, you know, we, I'm constantly, we get um, uh, some fund managers to come down, 
give, do market updates for our clients. I said we do a social networking thing. Our clients loved it, so they actually got to network with each other. Mm. Some of their own business, they made connections. So they're the sort of things that I guess um, I knew where the industry was going and what we needed to do and the difficulties in trying to get and not my um, practice principal who's older who wasn't used to doing that and showing value um, you know if the client rang obviously he would you know service the client but yeah. it was also making those connections and continually engaging the client and offering the reviews and doing all that stuff that was missing so guess that's how his business has benefit, benefit, benefited from yeah, yeah. having. Yeah. No, that sounds good. Okay. Yeah, the next question is from Shane. And I guess, uh, did you come into the business as an employed advisor? Is that? No, it's really quite unique. So I do have my own business. Yes. Yeah. Um, and Rick takes a percentage of my upfront yeah. fees right, that I get and then um, I keep my, my clients. They're mine. Uh -huh. My business owns those clients, but I'm sub-authorised through PUL Financial Planning. Uh -huh. So uh -huh. we have, yeah. Okay. Yeah. The reason I ask that question is because the question is um, when you started the business, uh, you started with zero clients, zero cash flow. Yep. How did you actually yep. manage that um, to start building a business knowing that you've got uh, three kids? Yeah, okay. So my husband works, he's got a good job here in Perth and I was working part-time, so I was studying before yeah. and, um, yeah, so I didn't have, I guess if someone was going from full-time employment to, to doing what, I'm, what I've done would be difficult, right? So I didn't have, um, you know, it was quite, it was a bit scary, but I didn't have, you know, much pressure because I didn't have to earn, you know, mm -hmm massive amount of money um so rick put me on a retainer for two months on my what my salary was so i had two months to you know cover myself yeah. and and then i went from there but i didn't obviously wasn't earning you know huge amounts of money yeah um, i think i think like twenty thousand dollars so you know that was the risk my husband and i were prepared to to take and you know that was the investment I guess we look at it as an investment. Mm. Um, and, you know, one of the things that was really awesome with Financial Wisdom was they included my husband in on the onboarding process. So, yes, I do have three young children and um, it's been a massive role reversal in our family. Um, and, you know, my husband has had to pick up a lot of the mum duties. It's yeah. shared, actually. You know, we share it now. And... Um, but he's very supportive and I think if he hadn't been included on the onboarding process and financial wisdom, wisdom didn't explain to me what would be required and how it would impact our family life, then maybe things would have been a little bit more difficult. I don't know, but he knew that, you know, there, I was going to be taken away from the family at times. I would have to, you know, um, see clients in an evening and that's something that I've been working towards with my mentor through the AFA mentoring program was being able now to say, well, no, I only work Monday to Friday. Weekends are, are my, are my um, family times. But when yeah. I initially started, I was doing appointments at all hours and all crazy times. But I, yeah. I, I've pulled back from that now. And that's where the mentoring comes in when you, when you talk to older advisors about, you know, how do I deal with this particular thing and just, you know, cap, just say no. Yeah. You know, you've got to put some stuff. So I'm still learning. I still yeah. heaps to learn. <laughs> and well, we all are. We all are. Yeah. Even, even all the old guys are, and girls are still learning. Um, yeah. yeah. So I guess from Shane's question, it wasn't as daunting because you weren't going from uh, you know full time wage to, and then yeah. you know. And all of you that do do that, you know, I admire you. And um, yeah, it would be hard. And I'll I'll, I'll say one thing. It, it has been absolute hard work and long hours and getting out there and it's not been easy. So if people think coming into this industry is easy and bam, you're going to have clients, you know, it's definitely not like that. It's all up to you and you've got to be able to get out there and, and talk about what you do and talk to people and, and, be, and, and be good at that, I guess, if you yeah. want to start from scratch. And and also what you what you mentioned about financial wisdom onboarding both you and your husband I, I think that's a massive takeaway that dealer groups if anyone's listening then you're part of a dealer group that's for me a no brainer yeah. 
And it kind of leads yeah. on to the next question. Um, with Financial Wisdom, have you felt, um, how has their support been in actually in growing your business? So John has asked that. Oh, um, oh probably. I absolutely love Financial Wisdom. Um, they have been, and you know, I, people will have their opinions of all their own dealer groups, but from the outset, like um, with the onboarding process with my husband and me being included in, you know, what's required of me, but just, what I love about financial wisdom is the support that we get as advisors, um, and my my BDM um, my BDMs because I've had two and they're both female BDMs. I've, I've not had a male one, so I'm not not um, you know I don't mean to be you know rude to the male BDMs, but um, they are absolutely awesome. They get what I you know they they understand you know what some of the struggles are in relation to, you know, balancing family, balancing your business and balancing the kids and, and all of that as well. But what I like about financial wisdom is the support we have in compliance and making sure, um, you know, that we're doing things right. I like the fact that, you know, we have strict um, uh, audits regularly, uh, making sure, I mean, I can pick up the phone and talk to, you know, compliance about certain things. I can pick up the phone and talk to research about certain things. I know that the research that, that's been done is really thorough research and, you know, they're, they're really dependable. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I couldn't say anything bad about financial wisdom. I, I really, yeah. That's good. Good to hear. So if anyone's looking to join, they're great. <laughs> no, they're great. They're very supportive. No, great. And Jenny Pierce has asked, uh, and you've already touched on this quite a bit, um, just about do you have mentors and business partners and, and how they help you grow? So uh, you've kind of touched on that a lot, but maybe just give us a shout out to uh, who your mentors are and, and how often are you kind of meeting with mentors? Um, so my, men, my one of my main mentors is my practice principal, Rick. And um, he is really passionate, again, about personal protection um, with his clients. Um, and, you know, he's encouraged me continuously from even when I was thinking, oh, I couldn't, I, oh, I might not be able to do it. You know, he was, Kath, go and study. Kath, go and do this. You can do it. You can do it. So he was, he's an amazing um and he seems to have done it for a lot of women. So I've, I've got to give him credit. He's very encouraging mm. in, in um, you know, getting out there and, and pushing you that little bit further. Um, and then obviously through the AFA mentoring program, I was able to connect with Mark Rando. And again, you know, I've had situations where I've rang him, client situations, and I've gone, oh, my God, what do I do here? I've been really, you know, it's upset me. And, you know, mm. he's picked up the phone. He's like, right take a deep breath, you know, this is what you do. Um, and I've actually travelled down to his office a couple of times and talked to him about how he's doing things in his business and, you know, he's been really open to sharing, you know, what they do down there. Um, a lot of my centres of influences as well, I, I guess, are mentors as well because they're older than me and they've been in the business. So I talk to them about things. Um, and I guess... You know, my main one of my main mentors um, in my career would have to be I'd have to say it would be my mum because when I started, um, you know, she you know looked after the kids while I was studying. You know, my husband at the time was just saw me studying all the time and nothing getting done, but my mum would be the one that would be um, you know, watching the kids, making sure I you know got my exams done, doing my study, you know, helping me out heaps. So, yeah, yeah they're. they're Biggest influences in my in my career. Awesome, mums are the best. They are. <laughs> <laughs> All right, a uh, few more questions. It's it's kind of more about how you're charging, but you you said that lots of people who aren't clients come to you for claim services. Um, do you guys charge yep. them a fee to to manage that claim service? Yes. So that's something that um, I identified at the AFA conference last year, um, and. Rick had done a lot of, he, you know, a lot of people would come in and, you know, they'd say, oh, this particular situation's happened, my partner's passed away, and he would help them through the process but never charged. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I said to Rick, we should be charging for this. You know, 
solicitors are charging a fee and we know what to do and you have 30 years experience in dealing with the institutions. You know exactly what to do. Why aren't we charging for this service? And believe it or not, the people that come to us who aren't clients that utilise this service are, if, you know, happy to pay the fee. They, they, they don't want to deal with the institutions. They don't want to deal with the stress. And, and they, you know, it's, it's, we've not had one, you know, one client say, I'm not going to pay, I'll go and do it myself. They were like, you guys are the experts. You know what to do. We'll leave it in your hands and tell us what the fee is at the end. We obviously get them to sign a client engagement before we, we undertake that work. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, so, and it's been, you know, we have built up a reputation over here in Perth as, you know, you know, offering that service to people. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And just more broadly about uh, Shane has asked to, he wants to know more about your fee um, structure and how, how it works. Just okay, like, um, so that's something, that, that's something that I've just really, you know, um, uh, I'm learning about as well along with you guys. So initially, um, you know, we would do the, the client declaration at the back of the FNA and tell our clients that there was a statement of advice fee and then there's an ongoing service fee if you wanted to opt into our ongoing service offering. And then we talked about the commissions and it would all be in the statement of advice. But a couple of times I'd done a whole lot of work for, for people and then presented my advice and, you know, they didn't want to proceed or, you know, that, you know, they were mucking me around a little bit. And that's something um, at Financial Wisdom, we have a business peer group and we discussed and highlighted that there are other advisors, um, you know, in the same situation. So, and one of the things that I took away again from the AFA conference last year was, you know, um, fee for service. So now I have before I pick up a file, so I'll do my first appointment, no cost, oblig no, no obligation, um, no cost involved, essentially for the first appointment for the client. But after that, we mail them the client engagement letter with the terms so it's clear and the client can understand and see the value in the advice. They agree to that. And then once I get that back, then our office will pick up that file and work on that file. But now um, I don't, and it all depends on the client's situation as well, but it, the way we, we charge our fees is articulated in that client engagement letter. Mm. So it eliminates those people that are, are, are wasting your time essentially. And I, I did come across you know, a few people like that and it frustrated me immensely because, you know, if an electrician went out there or a uh, plumber went out there and, and did all this work and then, you know, you go, you know, you, you, they go to charge you and you're only going to pay you like half of that. Yeah, yeah, you know? they No one would do that. So why do they do that in our industry, you know? We shouldn't, we shouldn't, we should be able to hand an invoice out and say, I've done all this work, there you go, now pay me. It's no different. And so I guess... We, sorry, sorry. I guess we, go, go, go. I guess we, you know, that's something that I'm still working on in in my and getting the confidence to do that and, and having those conversations with clients about it. But you know, it it is like I don't understand why we, you know, are looked upon as you know no different to an electrician. You know, I've got to feed my kids and put a roof over my head, like you have to do it for your your family. So, um, you know, why won't you pay me? <laughs> do you yeah. know what I mean? So, and so you just. Just and that, and where that client engagement letter puts it in clear, specific terms, so they know specifically, you know how we how we need to be paid, and and you know they've agreed to it. And just with that engagement letter, is that based on hourly rates? John's just asked if it's based on hourly rates, or is it just a kind of? It it, it depends on their circumstances, how we charge their fees, particularly yeah. you know. Um, every client can pay. We have different options, so it depends, but it's all articulated in that client agreement letter. Yeah, okay. Awesome. No, that sounds very good. Um, thank you so much. We kind of run out of time. We were right up to finish time. So thanks, oh. Heath, Pat, for coming. No worries. Um, I hope that um, went well, and I hope anyone um, you know, took away something from it. And yeah, Thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, how, do, how do we get in contact with you? If anyone who's watching, um, either live or watching a replay, how do we get in contact with you? Um, you can um, go to our business Facebook page 
uh, Catherine Cairns and Rick Palmer at Peel Wealth Financial Planning or look up www.peelwealth.com.au and um, contact us through there. But, yeah, happy to have a chat um, and yeah, give me a call. Awesome. Thanks, Gaff. Uh, my takeaways Thanks. were um, <clears throat> you, uh, you don't ask and you don't get um, and I, you, you mentioned that a yes. few times in the interview. Uh, the other one was um, uh, it was a, a thing that I thought was really good is you're just sitting in um, meetings with the estate planner um, and just to kind of learn from them, learn what other professionals are doing so you can kind of improve the way your understanding of estate planning uh, and improve your business. And the last takeaway from me uh, was talking to other advisors and pick up the phone and just see what they're doing well um, and ask as many questions as you can. So yeah, annoy would, them. <laughs> yeah, annoy them as much as you can. That were, that were my three takeaways. So, guys, I'm just going to sign off. Oh, Make yeah. sure that you head over to oh Ben. Oh, actually, me. I'm going to set put up a link to next fortnight's webinar with Brett Evans. And make sure if you're not on the mailing list, go to xyadvisor.com, jump on the mailing list. Uh, every fortnight we run these sessions, uh, so make sure you jump on. And tomorrow night, we've got a XY Live event in Sydney. So us, anyone in Perth or down in Melbourne, uh, we can get on the flight tonight or tomorrow morning to join in. Uh, and the tickets are online somewhere. I'm sure we'll find a link somewhere to, to get it. Um, so make sure you try and jump onto those live events and we'll see you in a fortnight's time. Thanks again, Kath. Thanks, Ben. Yeah. Thanks, Kath.